we started the Reformation 500 movement because back on the 31st of October 1517, which is more than 500 years ago, Martin Luther launched the Protestant Reformation. And so we produced the Great Century Reformation book and launched the Back to the Bible movement and Reformation 500 conferences and seminars all over the world, culminating in Wittenberg, Germany, October 2017, which was a very exciting time and place to be. Uh, part of the movement was Reformation 500 FIRE, FIRE short for Fellowship for International Reformation and Evangelism, which has grown to launch different Reformation movements in other countries around the world. And there's so much of the inspiration that we can get from history that can help us to help change our world today because Martin Luther changed the world. He was captive to the word of God. The Reformation was a defining moment when the Christian convictions and the courage of the reformers met the crossroads of decision and engaged the battlefields of belief and behavior. If I had a place to stand, I could move the world. The Greek engineer Archimedes was referring to the wonders of the lever. In principle, the capacity of a lever is unlimited. An ordinary weakling could move a rock the size of a house. All that he'd need would be a fulcrum that's a pole strong enough so it would not break and long enough to multiply the force. That and a place to stand. The force multiplying physics of the lever are a function of distance. The heavier the object or the weaker the person trying to move it, the longer the pole would need to be and the further away from it you'd have to stand. However, with the right fulcrum, with the right bar, with the right distance, all you would need to do would be to push the lever down and the boulder, no matter how heavy it was, would move. So theoretically, Archimedes famously declared that with the right fulcrum, with the right bar and distance, you could put a lever to plant earth and move the world itself, as long as you had a place to stand. Well, on the 18th of April, 1521, the 37-year-old professor of Wittenberg University found himself hauled in front of the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And standing before the assembled political and spiritual authorities of his day, Professor Luther was presented with a simple choice. Will you recant and reject everything you've been teaching about the gospel? Or will you be cast out of the church as a heretic, out of the state as a traitor to be burned at the stake effectively? And Martin Luther's reply shook the world. He changed history because he had a place to stand. Dr. Martin Luther declared, my conscience is captured the word of God. Here I stand. As John, the Lord Jesus declared, your faith is able to move mountains. Well, Martin Luther's faith moved the world because he had a place to stand. He stood on the word of God. The fulcrum he used was the gospel. This was balanced on a bar of the law of God. Dr. Martin Luther actually fulfilled what the Greek engineer Archimedes had merely hypothesized about. Standing on the word of God, using the bar of the law of God, and the fulcrum of the gospel, Martin Luther's faith not only moved mountains, it changed the world. It brought an end to the Middle Ages. It ushered in the modern world. The Protestant Reformation and the resultant scientific revolution, industrial revolutions, came out of the Protestant Reformation and they produced the most prosperous, productive, free nations in the history of the world. And all of this because Luther had a place to stand, and he made a stand on the unchangeable word of Almighty God. The Reformation was one of the most momentous turning points in the history of the world. It was led by men of strong faith, deep convictions, great intelligence, high moral standards, and tremendous courage. But towering above all these great reformers, Martin Luther stands out as the most courageous, the most controversial, and the most influential reformer of all time. Martin Luther has been alternatively described as the brilliant scholar who rediscovered the central message of the Bible. A prophet like Elijah and John the Baptist to reform God's people. The liberator who arose to free his people from the oppression of Rome. He is the last man of the Middle Ages and the first modern man. Ulrich Zwingli describes him as the Hercules who defeated the tyranny of Rome. Pope Leo X called Luther a wild boar ravaging his vineyard. Emperor Charles V described him as a demon in the habit of a monk. 
Martin Luther was born the 10th of November, 1483, in Eisleben, in Saxony. His father, Hans Luther, worked hard to climb the social ladder from his humble peasant's origins to become a successful copper mining entrepreneur. Hans married Margarita Lindemann, the daughter of a prosperous, gifted family that included doctors, lawyers, university professors, and politicians. Hans Luder owned several mines and smelters. He became a member of the city council of Mansfield, where Martin Luther was raised under the strict discipline which was very typical of that time. From age seven, Martin began studying Latin at school. Hans intended his son to become a lawyer, so he sent him to the University of Erfurt before his 14th birthday. I mean, imagine that at age 13, he is starting university already. Martin proved to be extraordinarily intelligent and he earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in the shortest possible time allowed by the statutes of the university. Martin proved so effective in debating, he earned the nickname the philosopher. As Martin excelled in his studies, he began to be concerned about the state of his soul and the suitability of the career to be a lawyer that his father had set before him. Well, while traveling by foot near the town of Stottenheim, a violent thunderstorm brought Martin Luther literally to his knees. With lightning striking around him, Martin Luther cried out for protection to the patron saints of miners. Saint Anne, help me, I will become a monk. Didn't even know to pray to God through the name of the Lord Jesus at that stage. He prayed to a saint. The storm around him matched the conflict raging within his own soul. And although his parents were pious religious people, they were shocked when he abandoned his legal studies at Erfurt and entered the Augustinian monastery. Martin was only 21 years old when in July 1505 he gave away all his possessions, including his loot, his many books, his clothing. He entered the black cloister of the Augustinians. Luther quickly adapted to monastic life, throwing himself wholeheartedly into manual labor, the spiritual disciplines, the studies required. He went way past the fasts and the prayers and ascetic practice required. He forced himself to sleep on a cold stone floor in winter without a blanket, whipping himself. He seriously damaged his health. He was described as devout, earnest, relentlessly self-disciplined, unsparingly self-critical, intelligent, and impeccable. Luther's rigorous pursuit of the monastic ideal devoted himself to study, to prayer, to the sacraments, he wearied his priest with his confessions and with his punishments of himself with fasting, sleepless nights, and flagellation, meaning whipping himself. Luther's wise, godly superior, Johannes von Staupitz, recognized Martin's great intellectual talents. And to channel his energies away from excessive introspection, he ordered him to undertake further studies, including in Hebrew and Greek and in the scriptures, to become a university lecturer for the order. Martin Luther was ordained a priest in 1507, and he studied and taught at the universities of Wittenberg and Erfurt. In 1512, Martin Luther received his doctoral degree, and he took the traditional vow on becoming a professor at Wittenberg University to faithfully teach and defend the scriptures. Now, this vow would be a tremendous source of encouragement to him later. Martin Luther did not view himself as a rebel, but rather as a theologian seeking to be faithful to the vow required of him. He didn't write his vow. It was given to him to, to take, to defend and teach the Holy Scripture. So Martin Luther committed most of the New Testament, much of the Old Testament, and all of the Psalms to memory. He knew it off by heart. The University of Wittenberg was founded by Prince Frederick of Saxony in 1502. And Luther's friend from his university days in Erfurt, George Spalatin, was now chaplain and secretary to the prince and deeply involved in the prince's pet project of his new university, which first started in this building, which today is known as Luther House. It was the Augustinian Order's monastery in Wittenberg, which later became the university buildings. Wittenberg at this time was a small little river town with only about 2,000 residents. Prince Frederick wanted to build it up to his new capital of Saxony. It dominated the bridge over the river Elbe, and so it's a strategic town in Saxony. And this is the St. Mary's Church, or the Stadtkirche, or the double spires, where Luther preached each day. Well, from 1513 to 1517, 
Martin Luther lectured at the University on the Psalms, Romans, and Galatians. Being a university professor would have been a full-time job, but Luther had other responsibilities as well. He was supervisor for 11 Augustinian monasteries, including this one at Wittenberg. Luther was also responsible for teaching regularly at the monastery chapel, the town church, that's uh, the Stuttkircher, and at the castle church, the Schlosskircher. It was a combination of Martin Luther's theological and pastoral concerns that led him to take the actions that sparked the Reformation. Martin Luther had long been troubled spiritually with the righteousness of God. God demanded absolute righteousness. Be perfect even as I am perfect. Be holy as I am holy. We are obligated to love God wholeheartedly, and we are obligated to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so Martin Luther, he's studying Psalms, and he sees real worship, and he recognizes we don't have worship like we read in the Psalms. He studies Galatians, he sees what real faith is, and he realizes I don't have that faith, and nobody I know has that faith. And he studies Romans, and he sees what real salvation is, and he says, I know nothing about the salvation, neither do any of the other priests I know. It's because of his great concern for his eternal salvation, Martin Luther had sought to flee from the world into the monastery. And in spite of the bitter opposition and grief and anger of his father, he buried himself in the cloister. He devoted himself to a life of the strictest asceticism. Yet despite devoting himself to earning salvation by good works, cheerfully performing the humblest of tasks, praying and fasting and chastising himself, even beyond the strictest monastic rules, he was still oppressed with a terrible sense of his utter sinfulness and his lost condition. And then Martin Luther found some comfort in the devotional writings of Bernard of Clairvaux, who stressed the grace of God, the free grace of God for salvation. And then he studied the writings of Augustine, which provided further light. Then as he began to study the scriptures in the original Hebrew and Greek, joy unspeakable flooded his heart. It was 1512. He began to study Paul's epistle to Romans, the verse, for in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And Martin Luther testified that as he began to understand that this righteousness of God is a free gift by God's grace, which we receive by faith. I felt entirely born again. I was led through open gates into paradise itself. Suddenly the whole of scripture had a different appreciation appearance to me. I recounted the passages which I'd memorized. I realized other passages too showed that the work of God is what God works in us. Thus St. Paul's words that the just shall live by faith did indeed become to me the gateway to paradise. I felt entirely born again. I stayed to open gates into paradise itself. Suddenly the whole of scripture had a different appearance to me. The burden of his sin rolled away. Up until then, Martin Luther tried to earn salvation by good works, although he never felt that he'd been able to do enough. But now God had spoken to him through the scripture. Man is not saved by works. Man is saved by faith alone. As a doctor, Luther had taken an oath to faithfully serve the church by the study and by the teaching of scripture. At the university, he is responsible to prepare pastors. Now, having experienced God's grace in Christ, studying God's word, Martin Luther began to see the emptiness, the self-absorption, the pious pretense, the superstitious unbelief of his previous religious devotion. Nor could Luther fail to recognize the same pious fraud and the pharisaical futility all around him. In 1510, before being made a professor at Wittenberg, Luther had gone on a pilgrimage to Rome for his monastic order. What he had seen there had shocked and disillusioned him. Now Rome was the preeminent symbol of ancient civilization. Rome was the residence of Christ's vicar on earth, the Pope. And Martin Luther was horrified by the blatant immorality and the degeneracy prevalent in Rome. The center of the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages life was the Mass, the sacrament of the altar. The Roman Catholic institution placed a lot of emphasis on the punishment of sin in purgatory as a place of cleansing by fire before the faithful are deemed fit to enter heaven. They taught there were four sacraments that dealt with forgiveness and the removal of sin and the cancellation of its punishment. First of all, baptism, then the mass, the penance, and extreme unction, or last rites. The heart of penance was the priestly act of absolution. 
whereby the priest pardons the sins and releases the penitent from eternal punishment. Upon the words of absolution pronounced by the priest, the penitent sinner receives the forgiveness of sins, release from eternal punishment, and a restoration to the state of grace. Now, this would require the sinner making some satisfaction or saying a prescribed numbers of prayers, like when I was at Catholic school, you know, pray the rosary 15 times or walk up and down the stairs on your knees, things like this. By giving alms, by going on a pilgrimage, or by taking part in a crusade, this is how you consolidated your salvation. In time, the, Middle e the medieval church came to allow the penitent to substitute the payment of a sum of money for other forms of penalty or satisfaction. The priest could then issue an official statement and indulgence, declaring the release from all other penalties through the payment of money. You can imagine there's a lot of people who prefer to pay money to praying a set amount of prayers or going on a pilgrimage to Rome or uh, walking up and down the stairs on his knees, as the case may be. In time, the Catholic Church allowed indulgences to be bought not only for yourself, but also for your relatives and for your friends who had died and who had passed into purgatory. They claimed that these indulgences from the church would shorten the time you'd have to otherwise spend suffering in purgatory. And this was a deal. This practice of granting indulgences was based upon the Catholic doctrine of works of supererogation. This unbiblical doctrine claimed works done beyond the demands of God's law earns a reward. And as Christ and his saints had perfected holiness and laid up a rich treasury of merits in heaven, the Roman church claimed it could draw in this treasury of extra merits to provide satisfaction for those who paid a specified sum to the church. So you can imagine the people liked this, and in fact this was so popular the Catholic Church didn't have to do much salesmanship to market this. The people wanted it. You know, give us a way of getting our relatives out of purgatory, um, let us just pay some money instead of having to go on a pilgrimage or crusade or say the Lord's Prayer so many times and the Hail Mary so many times and so on. And this became an industry. The system of indulgences was so popular the masses of people preferred to pay a sum of money to saying many prayers and partaking in many masses to shorten the suffering and purgatory of either themselves or of a loved one. The industry of indulgences became a tremendous source of income for the papacy. You can see the spaces led that you can put the amount of money and in whose name it's been done and how many years you're going to get of purgatory and so on. And this is at the Reformation Museum in Wittenberg in Luther House. And here's the treasury chest, where there's a space at the top to put your money in, and then there's four locks to ensure, with four different keys to ensure that the Pope got his money, and so on. In order to fund the building of the magnificent St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, Pope Leo X authorized a plenary, or a total indulgence, and so it was on this papal fundraising campaign to complete the construction of St. Peter's Basilica that the Dominican monk, the indulgent salesman extraordinary, Johann Tetzel, arrived in Saxony. The shameless and the scandalous manner in which Tetzel hawked indulgences outraged Martin Luther. There were sales jingled such as, as soon as the coin clinks in the chest, a soul flies up to heavenly rest. And this was all deceiving, gullible people about their eternal souls. So Luther's study of the scriptures had convinced him salvation comes by the grace of God alone, based upon the atonement of Christ on the cross alone, received by faith alone. We're not saved by works, we're saved by faith. Indulgences could not remove any guilt, and it could only induce a false sense of security. People were being deceived for eternity. And concerns had been growing since his visit to Rome in 1510 now led Martin Luther to make a formal objection to the abuses of indulgences. So on All Saints Day, the 1st of November, people would be coming from far and wide in order to view the more than 5,000 relics exhibited in the Schlosskirche, the castle church, which had been built specifically for the purpose of holding this massive collection, which included bizarre things. In, in the Schlosskirche, they had things like toenail of St. Thomas and milk from the Virgin Mary, bread from the Last Supper, a nail that pierced Christ's hands. Um, they had there some of the blood of Christ that was on a cloth. They had 
bones of St. Peter's and all sorts of things that if you venerated each of these, you'd get more than a million years of purgatory and so on. So Martin Luther wrote objections, theses, 95 theses, and it created such a sensation that within two weeks, they were being printed and read throughout Germany. Within a month, there were translations being printed and sold all over Europe. The Pope even received a copy. So this is the first act of journalism. Some people say Martin Luther was the first journalist, first person to impact the masses through a mass medium, and he did this through the printing press. The 95 Theses begins with the words, since our Lord and Master Jesus Christ says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, he wants the whole life of a believer to be a life of repentance. Martin Luther maintained, no sacrament can take away our responsibility to respond to Christ's command by an inner repentance, evidenced by an outward change, a transformation and renewal of our entire life. Luther emphasized, it is God alone who can forgive sins. Indulgences are a fraud. It's better to give money to the poor than to waste your money on indulgences. If the Pope really had power over the soul's suffering and purgatory, why would he not release them out of pure Christian charity? Luther's 95 Theses radically undermined Tetzel's business, almost bring the sale of indulgences to a standstill. Tetzel, Mazzoloni, Jan Heck produced attacks on Luther and they defended the sale of indulgences but didn't seem to make any difference. While none of Luther's friends rose to his defense, Martin Luther felt deserted, which he was. Many of his closest friends believed he'd been too rash in criticizing this established church practice. With the Pope's power challenged and the papal prophets eroded, church officials mobilized their forces to bring this rebellious monk into line. So first Augustinians at the regular meeting in Heidelberg sought to silence Luther to no avail. Then he underwent three excruciating interviews with Cardinal Kajetan in Augsburg. Then June 1519, Jan Eck, the finest mind in, mind in Europe that the Catholics had, debated Luther in Leipzig at the university. Some close friends to Luther tried to persuade him, settle matters peacefully, give in. But to Luther, this is now a matter of principle. Scriptural truth and eternal souls are at stake. In preparation for the Leipzig debate, Martin Luther plunged into the study of church history and canon law. And his studies convinced him that many of the decretals, such as the donation of Constantine, were forgeries. Donation of Constantine, the Catholics found somehow some document that seemed to look that the Emperor Constantine had donated the land and the power of the Caesars and of the Roman Empire to the church, which was proven later to have definitely been a forgery. So on the 4th of July, 1519, Eck and Luther faced one another off in the debate of the century at Leipzig University. The issue was being debated about the supremacy of the Pope. And Luther pointed out the Eastern Greek Church is part of the Church of Christ, even though it's never acknowledged the supremacy of the bishop in Rome. Are they all lost? What about the great church councils of Nicaea, Chalcedon, Ephesus? They knew nothing about papal supremacy. The bishop of Rome does not have power over bishops and other parts of the Christ church. But Eck maneuvered Luther into a corner and provoked him to defend some of the teachings of the condemned heretic Jan Hus. By making Luther openly take a stand on the side of a man officially condemned by the church as a heretic, Eck was convinced that he had won the debate. However, Professor Luther greatly strengthened his own cause amongst his followers, winning many new supporters such as Martin Bucer who became a crucial leader of the Reformation, and Martin Bucer actually helped disciple John Calvin, who was the second generation reformer. Luther published an account of the Leipzig debate and followed this up with an abundance of teaching pamphlets on good works, had a far-reaching effect teaching that man is saved by faith alone. The noblest of all good works is to believe in Jesus Christ, he taught. And Luther also maintained shoemakers and housekeepers and farmers and businessmen if they do their work to the glory of God, are more pleasing to God than monks and nuns. There's nothing in the Bible about serving God as a monk or a nun or a friar. The terms are not even mentioned in the Bible. And the printing press was a key part of his battle. On the 15th of June, 1520, Pope Leo X signed a bull excommunicating Martin Luther, describing Martin Luther's teaching as heretical, scandalous, false offensive, seducing. 
The bull called upon all Christians to burn Martin Luther's books and forbid Luther to preach wherever they had power. So all towns or districts that sheltered Luther would be placed under an interdict, officially excommunicate. So a town that accepted Martin Luther would not be allowed to operate burials, marriages, communions, baptisms, any church activities. So it's like excommunicating an entire town or district. In response, Martin Luther wrote against the execrable bull of Antichrist. And on the 10th of December, 1520, surrounded by a large number of students and lecturers, Martin Luther burned the papal bull, excommunicating him, along with books of canon law outside the walls of Wittenberg. Having exhausted all ecclesiastical means to bring Martin Luther to heel, Pope Leo now appealed to the emperor to deal with this rebellious professor. Previously, in 1518, when the Pope had summoned Luther to Rome, Prince Frederick of Saxony had brought all his influence to bear to have this papal summons cancelled. When Martin Luther had been summoned to Augsburg and Leipzig, Prince Frederick had arranged for safe conduct guarantees for him. But now the Emperor Maximilian had died. Charles V of Spain had been elected Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Prince Frederick himself had been a serious contender out of three for this position of Emperor. But, and he still held tremendous influence. So he prevailed upon Charles V to guarantee safe conduct for Martin Luther, as he was summoned to Worms for a council of German rulers. Now, in the year before his summons to the Diet of Worms, or the Parliament that met at Worms, Martin Luther published some of the most powerful influential treaties. In his address to the German nobility of 1520, he called on the princes to correct abuses within the church and to free the German church from the exploitation of Rome, the Babylonian captivity he called it. In the Babylonian captivity of the church produced in October 1520, Luther argued that Rome's sacramental system held Christians captive. He attacked the papacy for depriving individual Christians of their freedom to approach God directly by faith, without the mediation of priests and sacraments, which are unbiblical. And here a woodcut depicts uh, Huss and Luther serving the cup, the chalice, to the laity, not only the bread. So serving both elements, which the Catholics reserved only for the clergy. To be valid, a sacrament had to be instituted by Christ himself and be exclusively Christian. By these tests, he could find no justification for five of the Roman Catholic sacraments. Martin Luther retained only baptism and the Lord's Supper and he placed these within a community of believers, not in the hands of a church hierarchy. Indeed, Luther dismissed the traditional view of the church as a sacred hierarchy headed by the Pope. He presents a biblical view of the church as a community of the regenerate, in which all believers are priests, having direct access to God through Christ. Not that all believers are preachers, but all believers are priests, a priest being a holy bridge builder. He stands between God and man. A priest intercedes to man for God by proclaiming the gospel, and he intercedes for man to God by praying to God for him. In The Liberty of a Christian Man, published in November 1520, Luther presented the essentials of Christian belief and behavior. He removed the necessity for monasticism by stressing the essence of Christian living lives in serving God in our calling, whether secular or ecclesiastical. In promoting the Protestant work ethic, Martin Luther laid the foundation for free enterprise and the tremendous productivity that this has inspired. He taught that good works do not make a man good, but a good man will do good works. Fruit does not produce the tree, but the tree does produce fruit. We are not saved by doing good works, we are saved by grace alone, but once saved we should expect good works to flow from the true faith as fruit. Well, summoned to Worms, Luther believed he was going to his death. He insisted that his co-worker Philip Melanchthon remain in Wittenberg. My dear brother, if I do not come back, if my enemies put me to death, you will go on teaching and sound is standing fast in the truth. If you live, my death will matter little. Now Martin Luther was 37 years old at Worms. He had been excommunicated by the Pope. Luther would have remembered that the martyr Jan Hus, a century before, had traveled to Constance with an imperial safe conduct which was not honored. And Luther declared, the Huss was burned, the truth was not burned, Christ still lives. I shall go to Worms, though there be as many devils there as there are tiles on the roofs. 
So he had to be super courageous to go to Worms because Hus had received a safe conduct guarantee and it had not been honored and he had been burned at the stake. What made Luther think he could get away with making the same stand Hus had made and live to talk about it afterwards? Luther's journey to Worms was like a victory parade. Crowds lined the streets. They were cheering the man who dared to stand up for Germany against the Pope. At four o'clock on Wednesday, the 17th of April, Martin Luther stood before the rulers of the Holy Roman Empire. Charles V, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, ruled all the Austrian domains and Spain and Netherlands and a large part of Italy and the Americas. So at 21 years old, Charles V ruled over a larger empire than any man since Charlemagne. And amidst the pomp and the splendor of this imperial gathering, stood the throne of the emperor on a raised platform. He is flanked by knights in gleaning armor, six princes, 24 dukes, 30 archbishops and bishops, seven ambassadors. Luther was asked to identify whether the books on the table were his writings. And upon Luther's confirmation that they were his writings, the official asked Luther, do you wish to retract them or do you adhere to them and continue to assert them? Now Luther had come expecting an opportunity to debate the issues, but it was now made clear to him no debate is going to be tolerated. The imperial diet was ordering him to recant all his writings, the work of a lifetime in a matter of minutes. So Luther requested more time that he might answer the question without injury to the word of God and without peril to his soul. So the emperor gave him 24 hours. The next day, Thursday the 18th of April, the sun was beginning to set Torches were being lit, and Luther was ushered into the August assembly. He was asked again, will you recant what you've written? Martin Luther responded, some of his books taught established Christian doctrine on faith and good works. He could not deny accepted Christian doctrines. Other of his works attacked the papacy, and to retract these would be to encourage tyranny and cover up evil. In the third category of books, he had responded to individuals who were defending popery. And these, Luther admitted, he had written too harshly. The examiner was not satisfied with his answer. You must give a simple, clear and proper answer. Will you recant or not? So Martin Luther's response was first given in Latin and then repeated in German to make sure everyone could understand. And it shook the world. Unless I'm convinced by scripture or by clear reasoning that I'm in error, for popes and councils have often erred and contradicted themselves. I cannot recant, for I am subject to the scriptures I have quoted. My conscience is captive to the word of God. It is unsafe and dangerous to do anything against one's conscience. Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God, amen. And amidst the shock silence, chairs ran out for this courageous man who had stood up to the emperor and to the pope. Martin Luther turned around and left the tribunal and numerous German nobles and knights formed a circle around Luther, escorting him safely back to his lodgings. The emperor was furious. However, Prince Frederick insisted Charles V must honor the guarantee of safe conduct for Luther. Charles V raged against this devil in the habit of a monk. He issued the Edict of Worms, which declared Martin Luther as an outlaw, ordering his arrest and death as a heretic. As Luther traveled back to Wittenberg, Preaching at towns on the route, armed horsemen plunged out of the forest and snatched Luther from his wagon, dragged him off to Wartburg Castle. And you would have thought this was the work of his enemies, but actually this was the work of his friends. The kidnapping had been arranged by Prince Frederick amidst great secrecy in order to preserve Luther's life. Despite the emperor's decree that anyone helping Luther was subject to loss of life and property, Prince Frederick risked his throne and his life to protect his pastor and his professor. For the next 10 months, Martin Luther was hidden in Wartburg Castle as Knight George or Junker York. He translated the New Testament into German. He also wrote such booklets as On Confession, where the Pope has authority to require it, on the abolition of private masses and monastic vows. By 1522, the New Testament was available in German, available for just a week's wages. And this is his desk in Wartburg Castle, and you can even see the ink spot on the wall where Martin Luther flung an ink pot at the devil. In Luther's absence, Professor Andreas Kohlstadt initiated revolutionary changes which led to growing social unrest. 
And so in March 1522, Martin Luther returned to Wittenberg and in eight days of intensive preaching, renounced a lot of Karlstadt innovations and declared that Karlstadt was placing too much emphasis on external reforms, introducing a new legalism that threatened to overshadow justification by faith and the spirituality of the gospel. Luther feared that this new legalism being introduced would undermine the reform movement from within. When the peasants' revolt erupted, Martin Luther was horrified by the anarchy and the chaos and the bloodshed. So he repudiated the revolutionaries and wrote against the robbing and murdering horde of peasants. Interesting, the peasants' revolt and the Anabaptists behind it were taken by Karl um, Marx and Frederick Engels as the first true communist. And the original, pass, the original uh, Anabaptists were actually revolutionaries and violent. They were not pacifists at all. And so he repudiated these revolutionaries and aghast at the devastation and the massacres caused by the peasant revolt, Luther taught the princes had the duty to restore social order and to crush the re rebellion, the insurrection. Monsters, um, Anabaptists, they did the most heinous atrocities. Again, in 1525, on the 13th of, of June, Martin Luther married Catherine van Bora, a former nun from a noble family. Luther called home life the true school of character, and he stressed the importance of the family as the basic building block of society. Martin Luther said that he learned more in one year of marriage than he had in 10 years in the monastery. Luther and Katie were blessed with six children, so they produced the first pastoral family, effectively. Also in 1525, Martin Luther wrote one of his most important books on the bondage of the will. And this was in response to Desideri's Erasmus's book on the freedom of the will, published in 1524. Luther responded scathingly to Erasmus's theories on free will. And he argued that man's will is so utterly in bondage to sin that only God's action could save. Luther articulated the Augustinian view of predestination. He declared he much preferred that his salvation is in God's hands rather than his own. If it was up to me, I'd never been saved. If it was up to me to keep my salvation, I wouldn't stay saved. I'm saved by God's grace. I'm kept by God's grace. Salvation is by grace from first to end. As a result of the exchange between Luther and Erasmus, Many Renaissance humanist scholars stopped supporting Martin Luther. You can see Martin Luther depicted here, holding up an open Bible in the middle of the chaotic marketplace of ideas where people are discussing and arguing all sorts of ideas. And he holds up, Scripture alone is our ultimate authority. The Reformation brought about sweeping changes in the church and dramatic changes in all of society. First of all, the Reformation focused on bringing doctrines and forms of church government and worship daily life into conformity with the word of God. But of course, this had tremendous implications for political, economic, social, cultural life as well. Here in Wittenberg's town square, where I've preached and sung, um, you can see Martin Luther's statue and Melanchthon statue in front of the um, Rathaus, the town hall. And so you can see while the sword of justice is symbolized in the front of this town hall, you've got the word of God being displayed by Martin Luther. As the church is called to be a minister of grace, so the state is called to be a ministry of justice. Luther revised the Latin liturgy and translated it into German. Now the laity received communion, both bread and wine, as the Hussites had taught a century earlier. The whole emphasis of the church service has changed from the sacramental celebration of the mass as a sacrifice to preaching and teaching God's word. Down came the altars, up went the Lord's table and the pulpit with an open Bible placed in the center of the table. God's word above all things. And Martin Luther's monument promptly displays the open word of God. Luther maintained every person has the right and the duty to read and to study the Bible in their own language. This became the foundation of the Reformation a careful study of the Bible as the source for all truth, the only legitimate authority for all questions of faith and conduct. The church is a community of believers, not a hierarchy of officials. 
The church is an organism, not an organization. The church is a living body, which each believer is a member of. So Martin Luther stressed the priesthood of all believers. We do not gain salvation through the church. We become members of the church when we become believers. He taught regenerate church membership. So Martin Luther dealt with basic primary issues, including authority. What is our authority? The Bible alone is our authority, not the councils or leaders of the church. The Bible is above tradition. Salvation is by the grace of God alone, accomplished by the atonement of Christ alone, received by faith alone. Grace comes before sacraments. Sacraments symbolize salvation and grace, but they're not the means of it. And the church, the true church is composed of the elect, those regenerated by God's Holy Spirit. He taught regenerate church membership. It doesn't matter if your name's on the church roll down here. Is it on the Lamb's Book of Life in Heaven? And the priesthood consists of all true believers. He taught the priesthood of all believers. So the battle cries of the Reformation are those Latin phrases that summarized the Reformation principles. And the Protestant Reformation mobilized by Luther rallied around these great battle cries. Solus Christus, Christ alone is the head of the church. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone is our authority. Sola Gracia, salvation is by the grace of God alone. Sola Fide, justification is received by faith alone. And Soli Dio Gloria, everything must be done to the glory of God alone, which we have written still on our one-round coins on South Africa, Soli Dio Gloria. Despite Martin Luther being declared an outlaw by the emperor, he survived to minister and write for 25 more years. He died probably of poison, though, 18th of February, 1546. In spite of many illnesses, Luther remained very active, very productive as an advisor to princes, to theologians and to pastors. He published major commentaries, and we've got all of them in the library downstairs. He produced great quantities of books and pamphlets. He completed the translation of the Old Testament into German by 1534. And Luther continued preaching and teaching to the end of his life. He frequently entertained students and guests in his home. He produced beautiful poems and hymns, including one hymn that will live forever, Ein Festeberg ist unser Gott, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Luther did a great deal to promote education. He labored tirelessly for the establishment of schools everywhere. Luther wrote a shorter catechism to train up children in the essential doctrines of the faith. One point, Luther was asked, what's your greatest book? What's your favorite book? He said, I'd rather all my books be forgotten and the scripture alone be read. But then he added, but I'd like the catechism to remain. So his teaching the faith to children, he counted as the most important work, not just theological treaties. Interestingly enough, it's been common to portray Martin Luther as a simple and obscure monk. The Americans in particular like to call him a simple and obscure monk who challenged the Pope and the Emperor. Actually, Luther was anything but simple. He certainly wasn't obscure. He was learned, he has experienced, he has accomplished far beyond most men of his age. He had lived in Magdeburg. Eisenacht was one of the most distinguished graduates of the University of Erfurt. Martin Luther traveled to Cologne, to Leipzig. He had crossed the Alps, he had actually traveled to Rome itself. Martin Luther was a great student with a tremendous breadth of reading. He had excelled in his studies. He had achieved a Master of Art and a Doctorate in Theology in record time. He was an accomplished, best-selling author, one of the greatest preachers of all time, a highly respected theological professor, one of the first professors to lecture in a German language instead of in Latin. Far from being a simple monk, Luther was the prior of his monastery and the district vicar of 11 monasteries. He was a monk, a priest, a preacher, a professor, a writer, and he was a reformer. He is one of the most courageous and influential people in all of history. And so at the Reformation Monument in Worms, you can see Martin Luther stands above and central with all others around. But in the base, they recognize Savannah Huss, Wycliffe, and Peter Waldo. And in the outer ring, symbolized by fortifications, you've got the secular authorities who supported and protected him, like Prince Frederick and Prince Philip. Martin Luther designed the Luther Rose, which we've got in our bay window over there in the um, entrance uh, staircase. 
as he said, the black heart within the heart, the black cross, the cross must come first, and the heart is naturally red. So I must be reminded our faith in Christ crucified makes us blessed and happy. Such a heart should be placed in the center of a white rose to grant my faith joy, comfort, and peace. And that's why the rose must be white, not red. White is the color of spirits and souls and angels. So the rose in turn is in the middle of a sky-colored field symbolizing heaven. The blue symbolizes heaven. And my joy and faith is the beginning and my heavenly home is my future. The golden ring around the sky-colored field is a symbol of our eternal happiness in heaven, symbolizing the covenant of God without beginning, without end. And uh, precious as gold is the most precious and exquisite ore. And his symbols were accompanied by the statements, scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone. I took this picture in the church in Wittenberg. You see the Luther Rose is prominent. And we've got the map downstairs in the hallway showing where the Lutheran faith predominates, the, the pink areas where Lutheranism predominates, the green where Calvinism predominates, and the yellow where the Anglican Protestant faith predominates. Well, the Lutheran faith was adopted in northern Germany and also throughout Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland. Now, Luther was considered a controversial figure in his day. He's continued to be considered controversial to this very day. There are character assassins who hate me because I initiate the policy of Reformation Day and because I've written positively about Martin Luther. And I've had some people attacking me ever since because they maintain that Martin Luther is an evil man and there's websites dedicated to slandering him as the foundation of the Holocaust and other nonsense like that. Well, Luther challenged the power of Rome over the Christian church. He smashed the chains of superstition and tyranny, and he restored the Christian liberty to worship God in spirit and in truth. If I profess with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God's word, except precisely that point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, then I'm not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing him. For where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. To be steady at all the battlefront besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. Where the battle rages, the hottest we need to be standing there. We cannot go with the flow, go with the world. So there was a time when the churches in Cape Town were closing and remained closed because of the lockdown lunacy, mass grade madness, the COVID cult, salvation by vaccination cult. And it was at that point, when religious freedom was at stake, how many ministers made a stand for religious freedom and against medical tyranny, government interference? It didn't matter that the Soviet government outlawed the church. The church never stopped meeting during the dark days of the Soviet empire or in Red China. The church meets even under persecution. Maybe we've got to hide, but to have flinched at that point was flight and disgrace. Cowards. Um, Shame on these ministers who allowed their churches to be closed just because the government said they had to be closed. Maybe they needed to just change venues and meet in homes or something, but to have closed the church for a virus is pathetic. When the plague raged Wittenberg, Martin Luther invited members of the plague into his home. Ulrich Swindley went into the plague-ridden areas and ministered. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from heaven, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now this text is one of the chapters in the Greatest Century Reformation book, and all part of what led to our Reformation 500 events, centered on Luther's bold stand. Any questions about Martin Luther, the greatest of the reformers? Probably one of the greatest men of all time. Certainly, I think, the most courageous. And that's why we get on the 31st of October to celebrate Reformation Day. If you like the idea of having the Bible in your own language, you should celebrate the Reformation Day. If you like the idea of singing hymns in church in your own language, as opposed to coming to watch a choir sing in Latin, you can thank Martin Luther. If you like the idea of religious freedom and freedom of conscience, you should honor Reformation Day.
So we produced a 95 Thesis for Reformation Today um, leaflet, which we got translated into Dutch and French and German and Afrikaans, and that's available here. We've also got the latest Gospel Defense League letter, just back from the printer this week. And of course, our postal service doesn't work, so you can access this on the website uh, as a flip book, or you can pick up a hard copy at the table um, at the end of this meeting. But the Reformation 500 movement launched because of Martin Luther's phenomenal impact.